what I said, but that didn't happen that way. So anyway, let me find the scriptural place I want to start at. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning uh, to look at this. And um, because I think that's just a good place to start is at the beginning. So here we go. Move the screen down here, and I imagine we're going to have more and more people popping on as we go. So I'll try to keep my mind straight ahead as we look at this. Um, let's see. I, I'm going to start off with the curse, but we're going to back up just a little bit because there's so much to do about what when the first curse began. And then, and, and by the way, there's more than one word used for curse in the Bible. Uh, Aurora is what we start off with, uh, but when you get into the Greek language of Galatians, where the curse is lifted, um, I'm not really sure what which word Paul was referring to. Uh, it's a little bit difficult because he talks about cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Well, maybe we'll we'll figure that out because I do, I know that's in Deuteronomy, so we'll we'll get to that too. And we'll just see. But I want to start, though, because the curse, the beginning of the curse matters. So you know why the curse gets lifted. And, and of course, like I said, that's a general term used for the iniquities being visited from uh, all the way to the fourth generation. Uh, and I believe that's in Exodus where we'll find that out. So let's start here. Genesis chapter 2. Verse 17 is where we first get the first curse. And unto Adam he said, Because you have hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil shall you eat of it all the days of thy life. Okay. Remain no aurora. That's the word for cursed is the, and actually the ma is the ground. But the one thing you got to keep in mind when you're looking at that is that um, the word adama also comes, this is where we get the name Adam. And so I believe that there's still a connection, the fact of Adam and the fact that the ground is cursed. Um, and also keeping in mind, he ate from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, there is a little slight difference between the knowledge of good and evil and the knowledge of uh, the knowledge of, or excuse me, the tree of life, because both these trees were found in the midst of the garden. It really never speaks of those trees as being planted in the ground, but yet they both have a fruit, and the fruit that comes from the tree of life can be breathed as a breath itself. And so the breath had to come from somebody, and I believe that that breath come from God himself. So it's something to think about. And um, so we go on and we see that thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. The sweat of thy face shall you eat bread, till you return into the ground. For out of it were you taken, for dust you are, and to dust shall you return. All right, now that's where that first curse comes from. And I just want to make sure I've got that completely right. No, I'm sorry, the first curse is the serpent. Man got the second curse. The ground was cursed. Not He, he was not cursed, but the ground was cursed. In verse 13, and the Lord God said unto the woman, what is it thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among all cattle, from among all the beasts of the field, and upon your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of thy life. Um, and again, it's the word aurora is what is given to him. So the serpent is cursed. The ground is cursed. It's almost like the ground the tree grew out of, which also, by the way, man was taken out of. 
is cursed, and as a result, it affects the man because he's taken from that ground. That's just the one part where we get started at. But we're going to build on this. We're going to go now to Genesis chapter 4. And this is where Cain kills his brother. And Cain spoke unto Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and he slew him. And the Lord God said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of thy brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And now cursed are you from the ground, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. And again, it's from Min Adama, from the earth itself. When you till the ground, it shall no, it shall not henceforth yield unto uh, unto you her strength. And a fugitive and a wanderer shall you be in the earth now i don't know if you guys ever noticed this but the one thing that's always kind of stuck with me is the fact that god the very first murder and cain murdered his brother but he didn't require his life they wanted to kill him and he even said they're going to want to kill me and he's cursed, but God puts a mark on him that no man will touch him. They won't, they, he, he won't allow someone to take his life. That's your third curse that we read about. Then you have, from Genesis 27, where we're going to find out about a fourth curse. And oddly enough, when we look at this curse here, and again, it's Aurora, just like it was before, right? There's the word there in Hebrew, in dark blue. This is when Isaac, is passing the blessing on, and he thinks he's passing it on to Esau because he is the elder son. But instead, Jacob deceives him. Actually, because of reading this today, something kind of happened to me, and it's really inspired me to want to do a message just on this alone, the deception. We do know that later Jacob overcomes and when I say he overcomes, what did he do? He was able to break the curse. But he had to wrestle. Some say he wrestled with God to overcome that curse. But here's what's interesting. Let, let's see, Isaac brings him in. He comes in. We know he's going to deceive his father. <laughs> this is what really gets me, right? He's going to deceive his father to get the blessing. So when you, we wonder today about mo the modern state of Israel and the modern state of Israel believing in what they call the Frankist doctrine, do really evil so that the Messiah will come. They don't just pick these ideas randomly to believe. They actually believe that if they do something really bad, like what, 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 uh, uh, what, I mean, technically, Jacob's mother talked him into doing it. Really, wasn't even Jacob didn't want to do it. He said, "You'll bring a curse upon me." But his mother told him, "No, you go in there, put listen, put some of this, you know, I'll put some what it was, it sheepskin or something on him to make him feel like he was his brother because his brother was real, real a hairy guy." And so he says, "Go in there," and he said, "I'll fix it the way your father likes it," and you go in there and and he'll bless you. So he goes in before his father, and he said, So God give of the dew of heaven and the fat places of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. 
Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brethren. And let thy mother's son bow down to you. Well, he's making Esau's servant and everything. Cursed be everyone that curses you. Now, this is what's very important because the same blessing, the same words are going to be spoke over Abraham later. All right, the exact same thing. Everyone that curses you will be cursed. Everyone that blesses you will be blessed. Cursed be everyone that curses you, and blessed be everyone that blesses you. So Abraham got it to start with. It was passed down to Isaac. Isaac got it. Now Jacob has it. But, see, this is, this is where the mistake is made in today in the modern state of Israel. And, and, I mean, listen, I'm Jewish. I would love for it to be that way. There is a way where there is a collective blessing, but it's not under a state, and you're going to find out how that comes, because the curse had to be broken. But in this case here, the curse is not, the curse is not to Jacob, of course. It, it was a blessing for him, but because he says, cursed be everyone that curses you, and blessed be everyone that blesses you. But the important thing is, is to know about the part about is it, as we would say in the South, is it you all? Did he say, did God say, cursed be everyone that, that curses y'all? Did God say y'all or did God say you? He said you. There you go right there. That one letter right there, the way that letter is stroked, is a singular you, just like it was with Abraham. How are now, you? With Abraham, God said to him that all the families of the earth through him would be blessed. But that's all the families in the earth would be blessed. Not just one. Not, ju not just. You see, the thing is, there, the way the promise God wanted to bring down as he said in his word, is he's not willing that any would, that any would um, be lost, but that all might come to repentance. But at the time where the where we were looking at the seed that was going to come down through time, it start it would come down through Abraham's lineage. That's why that that blessing and the curses. Each time it passed, it was to one individual. That also signifies that the seed would be singular. Now, Paul makes that comment over in Galatians when he says here in verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith, Not and to seeds as of many, but as of one and thy seed, which is Christ. All right, so the seed is Christ, and it's not a whole bunch of seeds. Now, I know that Tovia Singer, and I know Tovia, acquaintance-wise, we're not like best friends or anything, but we know one another. Tovia will, has taught and really tried to dismantle Christians by saying Paul was a liar and Paul said this and Paul said that or Jesus said this and Jesus said that and he says they're all fake and phony and false. One of his favorite ones that he likes to do is the word seeds plural and the seeds singular. He likes to bash Paul on this one here in Galatians saying that nowhere in the Bible did it ever use the word seeds as in plural. I don't know how many of you understand the Hebrew language that are here tonight. In the Dead Sea Scrolls that we're looking at right now, I'll make it a little bit bigger, make sure you guys can see it good enough. This is the English translation of it, but I'm going to show you the Hebrew of this in just a moment. 
Okay, vineyard with two species because they are holy, but the sons of Aaron are the holiest of the holy. And you know that a part of the priest and of the people mingle and they unite with each other and defile the holy seed. There it is, seed, singular. And also their own seed with fornications. And again, we look at seed and we'd say, oh, well, that's a singular. Let's back it up to the Hebrew part of that. It's right here. All right. The holy seed, and it's flip-flop this way. Like if you have holy and seed, and Hebrew is going to be seed and holy. It'll be the other way around. All right. So here it is right here. Zara, there's your word seed, Zain Resh Aleph Hakadosh. Their holy seed, see, they mingled the holy seed. But he said, but their seed, et, which is like uh, for a direct object. Now, the reason you have the brackets here and then you have a letter on the outside. It's because it's harder for them to make out the letters that are on there. They know what it is, so they write what it is, but the one that's the clearest letters are the ones that are on the outside of the bracket. So it says, et zarim. But their seeds. And the mem is the pluralization of a word. Now, it's not there as in T-H-E-I-R, it would have to have a, a, a het in between the ein and the mem to be there as in possessive. But in this case here, it's seeds, plural. So they had corrupted their seeds. Oh, here we go right there. Their own seeds with fornications. And up here, let me go back just to make it make sense here. It's just the word seeds, plural, with, okay, that's im, with, and hazanot. Hazanot is the feminine plural for, because it's a tav when you have a feminine plural, with fornications, harlotry. All right, in other words, they went and slept with women that were not of their own kind. And and it's funny when I use that word, their own kind. And, and, and by the way, while we're at this, this is interesting. Let me back it up to here. It actually starts up here and then it kind of skips down. And concerning the pure animal, it is written that he shall not let two species mate. Concerning clothing, that no materials are to be mixed. And he will not sow his field or his, and then you go down, vineyard with two species because they are holy. But the sons of Aaron are the holiest of the holy. Because they're not animals, they're humans. And you know that part of the priest and of the people, see, priest and the people, it wasn't just the priest now, okay? They're, they're both mixed in with it. So we got a couple of people trying to jump in. All right. So the part of the priest and the people themselves they were mingling, mixing the seeds. And literally, it's kind of interesting. I kind of like this Dead Sea Scrolls on some of these commentaries they do because they're showing you the meaning of not mixing certain clothing and certain seeds. You know, you're not to make sure, you're not to plow and set, plow your field and plant two different types of seeds in there. And you're not to wear uh, clothing that's wool and flax mixed. Remember that Old Testament? Uh, people always wondered what. I remember I asked a rabbi that years ago when I was part of the Chabad organization. I said, why is it we can't mix? What, what do we got to wear? 100% cotton or only goat skins or what? What's the deal with this, right? He didn't know the answer. It was sitting right here in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The reason you didn't do those things is because he wanted you to always have in your memory, you don't mingle with a species outside of your own people. And I use that word 
specie outside your own people. By the way, if you happen to hop in here, if you're not on mute, if you can make sure you mute yourself, just we, we don't want to catch anybody in the background. It's kind of funny to us sometimes when people do that, though. Sometimes people say funniest things in here. Anyway, there uh, in one of the early Christian writings that did not get canonized, it said that fornication was a sexual relation outside your own species. And they were not talking about, you know, bestiality either. So, you know, one second, I'll, I'll fix that where we got that, because some people just don't realize they might be unmuted. So I'll figure out who we got. There we go. All right, we're good to go again. Let me go back. Sometimes it's hard to figure out how to do this because I don't even know half the time how to do this. How do I get back to go back to, oh, there we go, share screen. All right, so that's what we have there. And I, d I did a video on this a little while back. I had to go find the video. Let me start, here we go, right here. I actually just changed the name on it. Uh, seeds, singular or plural. Rebu I put. I added the rebuke Tovia Singer because I'm, I've got a whole series on those and and I and, and when I say that, you know, maybe I take out the word rebuke. That that's a little bit too harsh. I have considered Tobia a friend, but more and more the way he's picking on Christians, it's really just kind of become irritating for me because he knows it. In fact, he told me one time he said, "I'll never debate you because I don't know how to defeat you." Okay, well, I don't go to much for debates anyway, but um, but anyway, I did this video years ago, and and it had a lot more, or not years ago, a couple of years ago, and it had a lot to do with, with his, actually, I think I did it before Tovia said that about that, I don't know, but anyway, it's a very interesting video, and it is under the section of Tovia Singer on the playlist that I have there. Let's go back, though, I don't want to lose focus here, and... I'm so glad to see so many people jumping in here. By the way, those of you that are new here tonight, uh, I sent out some emails because I didn't announce it as I normally don't. I try to do this every Thursday night, this Bible teaching that we do here. We can have up to 500 people here live in our Zoom call, and I do it at 8 p.m. Eastern on Thursday evenings. Occasionally, I run into a problem where I can't do it, but I've been trying to do this now faithfully for the last few months, just depending on what goes on there. All right, so in this case here, this is where we see the blessing and the curse. The curses were, you know, as, as Isaac, Isaac is basically passing the man along, like Abraham had got it. God said to Abraham, whoever curses you will be cursed, whoever blesses you will be blessed. He doesn't say this to Israel as a collective whole. This is to deal with Jesus Christ, period. All right? Because even as the scripture says, and I need to find that real quick, so bear with me one moment so I can find it here. Um But the scripture about uh, where all the families of the earth would be blessed, Genesis 12.3. So I'm going to pull that up for you guys here. All right. Now the Lord said unto Abram, he's not even Abraham yet, just Abram or Avram. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from your father's house. I'll use modern English. And to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And be you a blessing. I will bless them that bless you. Okay. Let me just show you that right here. Mi that last letter right there, whoop, can't get it. That's singular. I will bless them. Now, here's the them. Okay. He's going to bless them that bless you. And he's going to, 
everything that's dealing with Abraham, let me just put it like this here to make it show you, make it easier. All these are singular. This right here is where it's plural, referring to the people. All right, I will bless him that bless you, and him that curses you will I curse. And in you shall all, Becha, okay, in you shall all call Mishpachot, not Mishpacha. If it was Mishpacha, if there was three letters, Mem, Shin, and Fe, with a He after it, it would be all family, which would be, you could still use the word Kol, because you would be basically inclusive of all the family. In other words, it would be all of Israel would be blessed. But he said, all the families of the earth, okay, all the family, and so he would bless all those of the earth. Now, Adama, the families of the earth, that's, I don't know how easy this is going to be to get for guys as y'all listen to this, but I'm going to try to say it anyway. All the families of the earth. Notice, though, what the curse is. It's really important, and I really want to try to make sure we get this. So we're going to go back. Let's see. Maybe we should start right here. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return into the ground, for out of it were you taken. All right. And here it is right there. The El Adama, the ground. He's taken from the ground. If Adam only his children, which we know that Noah is a descendant of Adam, it's his family that came across and made it on the other side. In that case, um, let me just touch base. Well, so I got a meeting I got to deal with later tonight, but I just need to touch base. Um, but the thing is, that would mean that all of Cain's descendants died off when the flood came because Noah, it was just him and his three sons and their daughters that survived. I know that even theoretically, that sounds almost nuts to think that the, because you have to ask yourself the question, how could all of Adam's children been messed up? Some like to argue, Genesis 6, that the sons of God saw the daughters of man, that they were fair, that that was Adam's sons, and that's what happened there. But it's actually not. That's the fallen angels. They are called sons of God. They were fallen. They were his sons. They are referred to as the sons of God. There are some other things that we could go into maybe on a different time frame to look at look at that. But what I'm really wanting to focus on here is this word Adama, because it's used quite a bit. And God curses. God doesn't curse Adam. God cursed the ground. Right here. He may knew Adama. Cursed is the ground. For your sake. The ground is cursed. All right. The ground is cursed there. The serpent is cursed and made to go upon the ground. Now, by the way, some would argue, well, Eve was cursed with bearing kids. Do you know that's actually not true? He prophesies that she will have children. 
הרבה הרבה, and there's only one other place in scripture, and I forget exactly where it's at. I've taught on this so many times, a lot of you would probably already know it anyway. It, it can mean either lying in wait, or it can mean greatly multiply. Here's where the problem comes in, though. How do you know which one it is? Well, according to the rabbis, they put the vowels in here for us to make it look like it's greatly multiply. The exact spelling means lying in wait. And I think it's in the book of Numbers that we have that. And it's an enemy. And to the woman, he says, if we were to translate it, the one lying in wait has caused you pain and will cause you. It's literally those two words right there in Hebrew. It's a great pain and a sorrow of heart. And he doesn't say, it does, you know, we read your hand, pain you shall bring forth children. It doesn't even say that in Hebrew. That's why I know that the word lying in wait would be a little bit more accurate because it actually says, teledai, if I don't quit covering it up here in green, teledai, you will birth banim, sons. Well, if here he's saying the one that was lying in wait is causing you sorrow and pain, like a pain of heart, a sorrow of, of heart. And then we know that Cain rises up and kills Abel, his brother, and he says, you're going to birth sons. Then God is technically prophesying to her. Now we read here, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. It doesn't even say that in Hebrew. You know, it's funny that when I read sometimes the English translations of the words that are in here, I find that the translations that are being done, it's almost as if it's like what's in the mindset of the translator. That's the way it's translated. But he actually says, the El Ishach, Ishach, and to, this is interesting too, by the way, instead of, to, instead of calling him Adam, he uses that beautiful word right there, which is like the fire of God, the ish, the ish we call it, because the yod in the middle gives it the e sound. So, but anyway, to your husband, you will return, you will turn to him. They put on there, thy desire shall be to your husband. It doesn't say a single thing about her desire being to her husband. It simply says she's going to turn to her husband. And he, yimasha becha, he will rule over you. And again, every bit of it's a prophecy. The one that was lying in wait, he's the one that's going to cause you great pain and sorrow. You're going to birth sons. And you're going to turn to your husband, and now he's going to dominate you. All because of one thing. A fall took place. They chose to eat from the tree, and she brought it to Adam, and he chose to do it to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, rather than taking of the tree of life. And the whole thing is, well, let me put it this way here. They had already partaken of the tree of life. That, that was, that's, here's what's beautiful about the tree of life. The tree of life is a free gift. That's what they say about Jesus Christ. He is a free gift. Yeshua HaMashiach is a free gift to you. What part of him is a free gift? That part of him that's the free gift is the same part that was to them, right? Let's go, let's see, where are we at? What chapter are we in? Chapter three. Let's go back with one chapter. The free gift is the life. What was it? In the out of the ground. 
mean, and here it is again, mean ha'adama. And those are you that, are, that have just been joining, because we've got people joining continually. We were, we were looking at Genesis 27. Or no, was it there? I'll find her here. Here we go. Yeah, right here. Where God is blessing Abraham. And we looked at the fact that it's singular. It's not, there's not one thing about, the only thing plural in there is when he says, in you, singular, in you shall all the families, mishpachot, of the earth be blessed. And I really wanted to hone down on that hadama. Now, we're actually looking at the curses for everybody that's joining here. We're really looking at how to break the curses. And what inspired this was two precious friends that we met recently that were that came over to Tennessee. We met we met up to over in Jamestown at a coffee shop. We one sister we've known for a long time. And um, while we were there, we were we were discussing that and, and they were talking about you know, the generational curses that have come upon the family, that really comes from the word iniquity and not the word cursed, but we're, we're getting into that. And, and so I'm looking at this whole idea of the curses, where they begin. And I'm also focused on the word Adama, which means the ground of the earth. Okay, so all the families of the earth would be blessed you know uh, and, and and of course those that cursed abraham would be cursed and it's again it's you never find it even when the blessing goes from abraham to isaac from isaac to jacob we never find one time where it is a it is a curse as a plural as a people and there's a reason for that Because the curse has to be broken by Jesus Christ. So if they cursed Abraham, he was the carrier of the natural seed. That's why I showed you over here in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, and here they show seed with fornications. They put it singular, but it's actually not singular. When you look at it in the Hebrew language, is Ram is seeds plural, their seeds with im as a note with fornications. But the holy seed, Zara Hakadosh. See, that's what he was saying right here. They're just all they're they're talking about Ezra, where Ezra said the people mingled and they unite each other and defile the holy seed. their own seeds with fornication. Now, the reason why I use the word seeds with fornication is because so many, both priests and the people were mingling the seed. The whole point of this is no one truly knows which father that seed of Christ was going to follow down through. This is why God got angry with them every time they defiled and mingled the seed. This is why the curses and blessings with Abraham was to him and him alone, to, from him to Isaac to Jacob. See, God knew it was from those three right there. And then it continues on. Through one tribe, all the way down until Christ would, were to come. And so the curse has to be broken somewhere and it can only be broken by one. That's why the curses and blessings to Abraham was to him and him alone. Now, granted, some people would take it collectively, but the thing is, it's really just because there's one seed following down through that family line, only one, not two or three. We go into Exodus. This is where we get the idea of the generational curse. 
keeping mercy unto the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and they will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the fourth, excuse me, to the third and to the fourth generation. That was pretty doggone tough. And that's the way, that's, that's what the law brought you. Because they chose, instead of cho choosing the tree of life, which by the way, and we kind of jumped away from that, I'll go back to it again. The tree of life, the Eitz Chaim, there it is right there in Hebrew and purple. The Eitz Chaim, I, I don't highlight the hay, the hay means the, the life, the tree of the life, okay? But what was breathed in Adam, Adam when he was laying on the ground as just a, a clay figure was the Chaim. And he, when he came forth, he was naked. And the Bible said he didn't even know it. I hate to tell you, but today we read in Revelation, I think it's chapter 3, in the Laodiceans, they're, they are blind, miserable, wretched, naked, and don't even know it. That's, by the way, that's all part of the same subject, believe it or not. He doesn't know it, but still, even though he doesn't know he's Nate, well, he, 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 excuse me, he wakes up, he takes to the tree of life, and that's when he realizes he is naked. Do you know what the naked part is? See, in Genesis chapter 2, he's put into a body in, uh, of the earth, but he was actually what I call a spirit man or a fireman to start with. That's why it says here, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman. Now, what part of that come from the man? Mean ha Adam. That means it come from the Adama. That's why I keep focusing on that word Adama. The Adama is the earth. In other words, it's dealing with the ground. What comes from the ground? God brings the people from the ground. Technically, we still come from the ground. How do you know that? Because every time when you were in the womb of your mother and your mother ate food, your body began to multiply cells and you grew. If your mother stopped eating food, you would not grow. You would wither up and die. Because why? You are from the dust of the earth. Every one of us are. And once you're born from your mother, you're still from the ground. Because in order for you to live on this earth naturally, you still have to eat of the food of the ground. And that's how you grow. That's why it says families of the earth or the ground is another reason why that's used as well. In chapter one, though, you are created, male and female created he, them, and he gave them dominion over everything. That's why when God breathed into that man that he made in a clay figure, he had to breathe in Chaim, a plural form, and the man himself had a singular form of the life. He had a Chaya right there. But he breathed a plural form of that life because they both were there. They were one. All right, but we get down here. The physical part that made the woman came from the Adama, mean Adama. But then he makes this very interesting statement. She shall be called woman. Isha. Not because she was taken and made from a Adam, but because she was taken out of, and we still get it in English, man, right? Still says man, but it shouldn't say just man. You want to know why? I do notice this, though. If you'll notice this, because she was taken out of man and they capitalize man. Up here, they don't capitalize it. And it's not the first word in the sentence. It's the last word in the sentence. They capitalize it because they're trying to make a distinction. Up here, it's from Adama or Hadam, which was from the dirt. 
but this man here, the mem here in yellow, I just made it dark blue, is the word from ish. Rabbis even noted that the yod in the middle of ish and the hay at the end of isha, put it together and you have yah, which is God. You take those two out, you have Aish, which is fire. They say if you take God out of the marriage, it becomes a consuming fire and they kill each other. I actually think it's a little different. I believe that it is God in the midst of them and they were light beings is what the Aish really stands for. That's why he makes that likened point there. And that's where the Chaim comes from. All right, that's where that life comes from. So anyway, we go back to the curse issue though. So what happens is then we see this thing about this generational curse. It's down to the third and fourth generations. That becomes a real problem. In Joshua, we read here, the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up there, wherefore, and now thou art fallen upon thy face. Israel hath sinned, yea, they have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. Yea, they have even taken of the devoted thing and have also stolen and dissembled also and they have even put it among their own stuff now we know this story here this is Achan Achan takes the golden the Babylonian garment the golden wedge goes and buries it in the earth and his and, and his family's house there it seems harsh though that God is going to curse the entire family and kill everybody in the family but if you actually read this in the Hebrew language every one of them were complicit with it but nonetheless, though, the way the word of God worked then, it was under the law. Remember, God cursed the earth for Adam's sake. He didn't curse Adam, but the earth got cursed, which technically made us cursed as human beings. And we came bound to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There's good on it and there's bad on it. And that's the way the law goes. It tells you what's good and it tells you what's bad. And you have a choice to which one you live by or which one you will partake of, which one you will do. It's not until we get to Ezekiel that God begins to kind of, as we're getting closer to the coming of the Messiah, that that law, even though it sits there still, is not, is harsh because we read in Ezekiel's prophecy in 18th chapter, the soul that sinneth it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father with him. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son with him. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. That's really the first mention we have of the law of Moses not being as harsh but galatians is where it's at this is where you know the curse is broken and by the way this is why i'm so hard over the issue about israel and the sins that are being committed against the palestinian people i'm also against the fact that hamas killed all the israeli people as well neither one was right or justified in what they did it goes right back to the cain and abel story but i say that because you cannot take under the law that god gave israel and say, well, God told them to go in there and drive out the inhabitants of the land and kill everybody. Yeah, before Christ, that would be true. That's under the law. But when Christ came, just like he severed that curse for us as individuals, that also severed the curse for them. See, as Christians, now I can understand Israel being blinded to this because the scripture says they are blinded. But as Christians, we should not. That's why the scripture said, Jesus said, if the blind lead the blind, they both fall into a pit. He also said, let them alone. And who's the blind? He said the Pharisees were blind. In fact, they said, you claim that we're blind. He said, they said, you know, we're not blind. And Jesus said, but, you know. If you were blind, then 
your sin would not remain, but because you say you see, your sin remaineth. The point being here, the Pharisees of 2,000 years ago, which clearly according to the Orthodox community, which I used to be a part of, so I know very well how this works, believe that they are the Pharisees of today. And Christian churches and ministers are saying that we have to learn from the Jews so we'll truly know who Jesus is. And Jesus tells you, if the blind lead the blind, you'll both fall in the pit. Well, you say, well, Christians are not blind. Well, according to Revelation, they are. In fact, Revelation takes you so far back, it's not even funny when it comes to that. It's very interesting. Um, in the book of Revelation, it says that uh, you're not only blind. It's Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily meaning that they're wealthy as far as, uh, well, you know, maybe it means that, who knows. You have need of nothing and knowest not that you are wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. You're in the same condition, and this is the church, this is what, John was speaking to as the church. The Laodiceans. But that spirit that was then is even today. Not everybody in, in all churches are like that, but as an overall rule, the spirit of each one of those churches exists to this day. And clearly the Laodiceans are very much the Zionist pastors of today. They are clearly blind, being led by the blind, headed for a pit, and they're naked. At least when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, though it was sin to do so, they realized they were naked. This group here don't even know they're naked. By the way, the nakedness is putting on of the flesh. The putting on of the flesh is a failure to recognize the spiritual application that the Holy Spirit dwells within you. That's what makes a person naked. They fail to recognize Christ within them. So we go back over here and we look at Galatians again. And in Galatians, he says, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not a faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. All right. So he is showing you if you're going to do them, you have to live in them. So I, I, the only thing, and I think this is what Paul really tried to make clear. Also in the book of Hebrews, you have the same identical uh, uh, belief there if you're going to live by the law you'll have to live by every law then the curses do apply the only way for you to get rid of a generational curse is to accept Jesus Christ and what he did for you so then I'm free so here we go Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. He had to become a curse in order to break the curse that we were under. Now, Paul also says later, too, you know, you know, the law is, do I say that the law is, is evil? No, he said, if it wasn't for the law, I wouldn't know thou shalt not covet. There's a place for that. That's why the tree is a tree of knowledge of good and evil. The question is, is what do people accept on that tree? But if we go outside, if we go beyond that, if we go in and we accept the tree of life, 
which is Jesus Christ. And as he breathed on the apostles and he said, receive ye the gift of the Holy Spirit, if we will allow him to breathe upon us and receive the Holy Spirit, then you have been, you have been loosed from the curse. There's not a single curse. Anything that's happening to you then has nothing to do with a generational curse. All right, nothing. All that is just completely false. So the thing is, is we want to be loose from that. That the blessings of Abraham, see, notice what he says here. Everyone that hangs on the tree, is, that's the one that is cursed. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That's the fulfillment of that passage over here in Genesis, chapter 27 it is, on this side over here, that all the families of the earth shall be blessed. See? All will I will bless them that bless you and curses him that curse and I will that curses you will I curse. And that after Abraham died, it went to Isaac. After Isaac died, it went to Jacob. After Jacob died, some say it went to Joseph. When Jesus come on the scene, though, it was laying in him and him alone. And then he had to hang on the tree. See, because the tree, the curse started with the tree of the tree of knowledge. in the Garden of Eden. And the serpent beguiled them hanging from a tree. And Jesus had to take and hang on that tree, the, the tree of law, the tree of good and evil, because how do, you, how do we know that that is the tree? And in, in Genesis is the same thing as the law, because Jesus was condemned by the law. And that was the tree he hung on. He was hung based on the law. The very curse that started the whole thing rolling was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that tree of knowledge of good and evil was the law because Jesus hung on that tree when he was condemned by the law. And he became a curse so that curse could be lifted from us. So today, nobody has to be under that curse. And that's why it says that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promises of the Spirit through faith. Not only does it break all the curses, it break, it, that's what opens the door for whosoever will let him come. And if we cut a life short because we still are holding on to the law and condemning people, like they, not just the Middle East, the people in Ukraine is no different. All the wars that go out there and we kill all these people and everything, you cut these lives short. Did they ever come to know Jesus Christ? The sad thing, this is when you, by the way, when the scripture says they're blind, naked, and don't know it, when you got Christians killing Christians in Ukraine, that's pretty blind. Pretty blind. I remember one time there was a Christian man that I knew that was in the war, in World War II. And he said that he was sent in on the other side of the enemy line of the Germans. He said to find out what the enemy's position was, what they were doing, so that they could ambush them and kill them. He said he got to one foxhole. He said and he understood German. He said the man was reading his Bible, and then he closed it, and he started praying, asking for God's mercy. He said it got to him so badly. When he got back to the company, He just told the commander, and he said, we should just forget it. 
I forget exactly how he put it to me, but they did not do the attack. And he said, I had to do that. He said, because how could I go and kill my brother? He said, here I am a believer and really believe the Lord with all my heart. And over there in a foxhole, just the other side, I'm about to take the life of a brother that loves the Lord. He said, I can't do that. Israel, like I said, I can understand Israel making this mistake because the scripture says they are blind. Jesus said, I counsel you to buy of me I salve that your eyes might be opened. That's the only way to get the curse lift, lifted. When you accept him, you accept what he's done. And believe me, when you truly from your heart accept what Christ has done, it'll also lift the desire to bring about a curse on someone else. He's already paid that price. Why, why cause anybody else to pay? Anyway, I love you guys. I would take and spend time with y'all and take questions. We'll do it next week. Uh, I promised Bonnie that I would do the recording we do tonight. Uh, I know there's some chat questions in there. Uh, Brother Ron, is there anything in the chat that, that maybe I should try to address real quick before we close? You're on, you're on mute, Brother Ron. You should be able to hear me anyway, brother. That's right. <laughs> uh, isn't this exactly why God the Father chose Mary from the line of King of David or King David to break the curse and bring genetically pure? Yes, yes. By the way, there's one thing I want to share with y'all real quick. Now that you bring up Mary, that's another one that Tobia really likes to go after. Is Isaiah? I believe it's nine six where it says about a virgin shall conceive. That's the way we translate that into English. Um, it actually uses the word Alma. Alma is a young maiden. Now I used to argue with Toby and I'd say, "What's the difference?" A young maiden, we would assume it's a virgin. Well, he said, "Well, if it really was a virgin and Isaiah meant a virgin, he would have said Bitula." I was reading in the Hebrew Matthew recently, and Jesus was talking about himself, and he quotes this, and he says, he said, the son of man, you know, ben Adam, which means, again, what is he? He's the son, he come from the earth. And then he said, the son, he says, ben bitula. He doesn't say that he was from Alma, a young maiden. He literally said he was the son of the virgin. And that really got me. I like the Hebrew Matthew. I know some people don't, but I'm like I'm of the same mindset of Nehemiah and Gordon when it comes to that. I 